sing you the desert where black men sail. Water hold the water where white men failed. See the face of dreamers, forgotten souls. Hear the voice of cattlemen crackling the coals. Maybe we will learn what's written in the sand. A thousand generations of living off the land. The aspect of my identity, it tells me where I'm from, where my ancestors are from, and it's my future, my survival. This country is so old and so weathered that you can see the bones of the country sticking out, and the, the skin on it is so very thin because it's been weathered away for so long. The outback is impossible forever and it's free. Forty years since I left the farming life and became a concert performer. And over that time it's been this ancient country that's inspired my songs. Well, you don't have to look around. It's the outback, it's the environment out there, it's the colour, and it's that sense of timeless land. It's the people. For you to look at it, it might be bare, but I think the country is beautiful. The sand dunes and all the outback flats, you know, out there on the blue plain country. It is beautiful. No way can I find an end to what it means to me. It occurred to me it's probably time I went out to the outback again and catch up with some old mates. Just turn up unannounced, sing some songs around the campfire, around the bar, whatever. I'm not going to go on a straight line. I'm nearly at Burrsville now. From there, I'll follow the old droving route down south through Maree and onto the Flinders Ranges. Then I'm going up north to Alice, mining towns Altunga and Coobapiti. The backbone of the women who fight on and on The healing of the sunset when all is said and done The What it means to me, the Outback. <laughs> round the corner from the Birdsville Hotel, John Menzies is showing me around his working museum. Little 78 record here. All talk, oh, yeah. all Bible stories. Okay. Just lift that one up. Oh, I could do with some Bible stories, I yeah. think, yeah. There's your needle, a little 78 needle, got to change it fairly often. Wow. So that becomes your speaker, and you have a pencil or a skewer, and away you go. This simple record player is not a toy. It is designed for a special purpose. Gospel Recordings Incorporated is a missionary society whose job is to cater for people who cannot read. Do you know that two-thirds of the world's people are illiterate? God speaks in many different ways, doesn't he, really? So did the minister have to do this for the whole church service? Yep. <laughs> yeah, and uh, not many people have seen those. Uh, I certainly haven't seen Just one before. Just put that one away. And then, since then, they don't use this one anymore. They've got a little, this one here, no power, no springs, no batteries, and this little gazette player. This is one they're probably using today. Just put it on play and turn the handle. They come the stations and brought the <laughs> That's slim. That's slim. Good old slim. They can recognise us, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That the eyes are rodeo. There you go. John, you go around there and I'll show you the three strange pumps. Right. Now this one's a chain Hercules water pump. Came out from England. It was sold in Sydney in 1910 by Gibson Batland Company. That company's still going in Sydney. Okay. When I push the horse gears round, you see the water come up the chain and it'll carry water up 40 foot. Little trough, the little furphy trough. Here we go, now watch that chain. You're not supposed to be doing that though, are you? No, it was a meal today. Now this one's got a chain and washers, yes. and according to advertisement in there, it'll carry water up 40 foot too. Look out for your jeans. Pretty good play there. Now this one's about 1890s. It's called a purifier. So he's putting the air back into the water. John's incredible pumps reveal the Outback's most precious resource. I don't think you'll see three pumps like those anywhere. What's the backbone of the Outback? The backbone of the Outback is water. Water is the backbone. Just five minutes from the museum, there is a spring where boiling water forces itself to the surface. This water comes from the Great Artesian Basin, which made life on the outback possible. Over hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years, uh, water accumulated down in deep aquifers underneath very substantial areas of Australia, under parts of Queensland and New South Wales, a fair part of the Northern Territory and Northern South Australia. Enormous quantities of water. What you're looking at is this immensity of fossil water that's underground, sometimes thousands of metres down at the deepest for some of it, but uh, sometimes quite close to the surface, sometimes natural springs. In places they bubble to the surface quite naturally and scattered across uh, parts of northern South Australia, for example, there are bubblers where the water would be forced through by pressure from underneath. And these provided the Aborigines and the indigenous fauna with uh, very important and reliable sources of water. They were the focus of all life, really. Certain of the ancient diprotodons, uh, the great bullock-sized extinct animals, the genuinus, which were bigger than the biggest birds on Earth, those animals' skeletal remains have been found focused in, in the vicinity of some of these ancient springs and those ancient waterways. The Europeans became conscious of the fact that there was a vast supply of water underground and if they needed anything for their pastoral animals and to live out there it was more water. And so from about the 1880s onwards you find that more and more people were putting down bores to drill into the Great Artesian Basin to bring the water to the surface. Hey, I'd like to pay respect to uh, the Moka Narura mob, uh, especially to Joyce and Jimmy here. Would you give them a round of applause? <laughs> and I travelled quite a lot with, uh, with Warren H. Williams from Hermansburg from the Western Arana mob, and uh, we've uh, done some songs together. This is one uh, I was invited out there years ago um, to camp out at uh, west of Hermansburg Berg there, and uh, Warren and his family came out and I, I invited them out to come out and have a steak, you know. So I lit the campfire and got the damper going and everything and I uh, put a few chairs around the fire and they all came out and sat on the ground. And I thought, how bloody stupid am I, eh? <laughs> we'll sit on a beach and you know, it's a beautiful red sand and we think we have to sit on a chair. So uh, it made me think about how gentle the land is, you know. It's not a hard place It's a soft and gentle land Gonna lay my bed On the soft and gentle sand Hear old man time Whisper in my ear A thousand feet The pins 
through here Hear the desert wind Play a lonely tune Through the desert oak On a rusty dune Stay a while And it's all so clear A thousand feet Okay, Joyce, you got a bit of bait there for me. Yep, there you go. We can get the flies off it. Yeah. What are we going to catch here, do you reckon? Well, I think we're going to catch some yellow bird. Oh, yeah, they're nice. I'll just toss in and see how I go. I'm out fishing with Jimmy Crombie and his family from the local mob. It hasn't been plain sailing for black and white relations in the outback in the past, but in hindsight, we needed each other. In them days, that's the only thing they employed was the Aboriginal. Well, there wasn't too many white men around. I was hate when I learned to ride a horse, but I knocked around at horses all my life. My dad was an old contractor. I was old, but I learned riding fed when I was eight. I learned to ride horse because I wanted to be a stockman. My first job was on Anna Creek Station. As a stockman, the job involved mustering cattle, drafting out the prime stock and that and sending them off to the market down south in Adelaide, branding the calves and that. Just outside Birdsville is the start of the legendary stock droving route, the Birdsville Track. The Birdsville Track was formed, I guess, initially as a stock route for cattle. Before Federation in Australia, each state had its own laws and rules and Birdsville on the corner of Queensland and South Australia Northern Territory was a customs depot. So all the cattle trading from Queensland and the Northern Territory had to come down through Birdsville and follow the river system down into Maori and then on to Adelaide to market. So Birdsville being a customs depot of course everything went through there so hence the Birdsville track. When they were driving mobs, big mobs of cattle down the Birdsville track um, they'd have to stop, pay a levy to go from one state to the other. It was quite a substantial town. Uh, in fact, in those days, it had three hotels, uh, even a cordial factory. Then in the 1880s, um, a railway line was put through from Adelaide to Maori, which is at the southern end of the Birdsville track. And of course, that's where the cattle would come to, go on the train then, and to markets in Adelaide or Melbourne. I have very fond memories of Burrsville back in 2002. Uh, who was here 2002 for the first cattle drive we put, the big tourist cattle drive? Anyone here? No one. Very Goldfield. Very Goldfield, yeah. They were very man, mate, the very man. Anyway, I was that, that keen to get here. I'd half written a song before I did get here. We flew, we flew. And, uh, but I thought I'd better talk to Eric about the, the, the Burrsville track itself, what he knew about it. And of course he knows it like the back of his hand. So you'll hear what he told me in the second verse. It's called Skinny Dingoes. What am I doing here on the banks of the Diamond Tina where only skinny dingoes and horny lizards go? The moon is loud and clear like the notes on my concertina. I'll play another droving song the white owl wouldn't know. Forty years been droving no woman by my side No one gives me orders On the dusty road I ride But the sun can sure get angry As it burns you from the ground One day those skinny dingoes Can drag my bones around The driver was the boss, he was in charge of mobs of cattle. Now cattle, mobs of cattle could range from anything from 500 to 5,000. You had to like the job to do it. And if you didn't like it, well you wasn't a driver because you wasn't looking after your job. You wasn't to look after the cattle. You got to look after the cattle and you got to like stock and you got to like stock to look after it. With him he'd have horses of course, so he may have a couple hundred horses and he would have what we call a horse tailor that uh, would look after the horses, then he'd have his stockman, and he'd have his cook. I was at the end of the uh, olden days, you could say, when we were still watching cattle, and um, you know, you'd be like being in the army, you'd be getting up before dark and having your breakfast and catching your horse and moving off of the cattle when it's still dark. <laughs> The 
was always um, you know, a big highlight to see a driving team with a big mob of cattle coming into town. The men all scruffy after being out for you know, six or eight weeks living in the swag. You could um, say it was romantic. Hmm. So see you later Birdsville, you're far too flash for me. While the beer was cold and yummy, from here it's Billy T. The mob is keen on moving and that sounds good to me. Good feed, they reckon southbound, we're heading for Murray. Well, you're just out in the bush, living in the bush for, you know, weeks and weeks or, you know, up to three months or more and, you know, you, you didn't have a shop to go to buy your food, you had to carry your, all, your, all the tucker you needed and kill a beast and salt your meat and the cook used to make the bread and the dampers and, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty romantic, all right. To do what they did, they had to be romantic. Well, could you say romantic fools? But, I mean, their lives were pretty tough, but out there, I mean, the pace of life was so gentle. Cattle travel about 15 kilometres a day at their normal pace, so you can imagine a very gentle pace. It was a timeless land for them. 40 years been droving, no woman by my side. No one gives me orders on this dusty road I ride. But the sun can sure get angry as it burns you from the ground. One day those skinny dingoes can drag my bones around. One night we, we was on watch and, uh, and the cattle rice. So just riding through the night in the dark of the thing and you're just putting your trust into your night horse. You know, which had the skills and knowledge of what to do and when to do it and how to do it. On a dark, stormy night, when those cattle rushed, or as the Americans would say, stampede, there was no romance in their lives then, because it'd be all hands on deck and riding on horses flat out in the night to bring cattle back. <laughs> no romance. Day those skinny dingoes can drag my bones around. Well, if you know Eric, you'll get you relate to this story. Is uh, just before it, I said you got to watch uh, watch when I sing the song, Eric, because it's uh, you inspired the second verse, and and uh, so he said, no worries, mate. But by the time I sang it, he'd had quite a few beers. And he, after I was saying, he walked past the front of the stage and said, that's a bloody beauty, John o. <laughs> And his wife was about two metres behind him because she was real worried about how he was going to handle the cattle drive the, drive the next day, you know, as you can imagine. And uh, anyway, after the show, I was keen to have a beer, so I, I went looking for him. I found his wife again. And I said, where's, where's Eric? She said, I don't know. I've lost him. So an under black said, and he rib, dug me in the ribs and said, just around there behind the cattle truck with his mates, mate, go around there. So I snuck around there. And for sure enough, he was there, so I pulled up a stump and had a beer. I said, geez, Eric, you've been having a good time tonight. He said, yeah, I'll be having a better one if old handbrake wasn't following me around everywhere. <laughs> Back in 1938, Eric's grandfather, Claude Oldfield, and his great uncle Jim were taking a mob of cattle down the Burrsville track when a couple of horses disappeared. Jim Oldfield chased them. Then his horse went lame and it was a burning hot day and he ran out of water. Things looked pretty bad. He so, thought, well, this is it. I'm done for it. I'm finished. My horse is knocked up and I'm too far from anywhere. And uh, he got his, felt his pocket and found a bullet. In those days, always carried a bullet in your pocket. He always might have destroyed a wounded animal or something. And he had this bullet and he wrote a little note in his notebook to his wife. Only either old uh, horse knocked up. I'm perishing. We don't happen that's don't happen something happened soon. I won't see it. And that'd be all the bloody little thunderstorm come up and laid water. Watered his horse and he got a drink. And he got back. But on the way back he didn't say to take the same track as the horses, he took a shortcut to meet. Mob of cattle they're driving. 
On the way back, he ran into a big water hole. Kunshri water hole on the Kali Kupa. And the deer, this is a beautiful bit of dirt here. No, this is a big water hole, six mile long it was. They were average about 20 foot deep. So when they got the Maori with this bob of cattle, they had a debate on this water hole. And they thought they'd go down to Adelaide and see the land department, see what this bit of water hole was. And they said, oh yeah, that's Crown land. Yeah. They said, can we take it up? They said, yeah, you can take it up if you're game enough. They just took this bob of dirt up and that's how the whole field started off on the bird's track. He's one of a dying breed, Eric Oldfield. His cousin Shane runs Clayton Station today, and he's telling me about the early days when Jim and Claude moved their families here. These two brothers, they started up, and then the other brothers come down with their wives, yeah. and, and they just sort of made a home of it. It's old bow shed and that. They, and because the women, because it's only bow shed and had a, you know, cow dung floor, and, <laughs> and, um, they used to moan a bit, so they called it Mona Downs. So, oh, really? <laughs> mm. They used to have kerosene rags around their ankles to stop the ants walking up their legs and all that sort of thing. So. How do you mean a cow dung floor? You put the cow dung with the dirt? Was that yeah, and you mix it in with a bit of water and tap it, you know? Wow. Tap it down and make it all goes hard. And, yeah. The smell disappears eventually, I huh? suppose, yeah. <laughs> but running cattle in the outback gets down to one thing. And what about the water situation? I mean, it's very dry out here, isn't it? So. Yeah, it gets a bit that way. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it rains now and again. Uh, last one was nine years ago. Artesian water is, we wouldn't be able to survive without artesian water, and that, that's, that's our backbone. How far underground is that? Um, here it's, you know, 404 metres. The further you got the water, and that gives you more area for your cattle, you know, because yeah. that was our only water. This was before poly pipe days. And this board drain here from the house, that used to go down 40k. And we'd go down there every day. We'd get up in the morning and we'd dig. And we'd dig till sundown. Mm. And two, two shovelfuls wide and just keep going. And every time you get a dust on them, you'd have to go back and start again Not and really. dig again. I heard you say earlier today that uh, you had two mils of rain the other week or something and that gave you a little bit of grass. It yeah. doesn't, doesn't take much water to give you a little bit of grass. No, because it's a desert environment and you get the desert plants, you know, yeah. and a couple of mils, like you get that little germination, it's there poking its head yeah. through and if you fluke another few points, you, you know, you're halfway there, fat cattle. Yeah. So what's their average over hunting, you know, 30 years or something? Four inches, yeah. Four inches, yeah. Wow. Mm. And Not if much. we can get that, we're laughing, you know. Yeah, really. If we can get our four inches, we're That's laughing. Amazing, but isn't it? yeah, good old country just only lacks one thing: is rain. I fought with the um, South Australian government because they wanted to close all the waters down on these board drains. These boards were put in in the you know late 1800s, early 1900s. So there's a hundred years of ecosystems built up along them, you know, and the birds, travelling birds, and and nature sort of live on them. And now we've been able to keep, you know, the important ones through up and down the track and, you know, in the district going. And, and you know, there's 120 species of different birds live down here on this one. And in the middle of a raging drought, yeah. the only green patch you got is that wetlands. The yeah. only life you got and the only birds are living down there. Because yeah. they can't live at a trough because they get drowned in there or they get drowned in the tank. But, you know, where they can get a drink off the ground, and you know, and you can go down there, you can drive around and see, you know, your cattle not too good. And, but you can drive up to there and there's birds happy, there's green yeah. feed, yeah. and it just gives you a lift, you know. This lake on the way from Clayton Station to Maree is actually a mirage. But in Maree, I find something even more unexpected. One of the remarkable things about Outback Australia, I think, is that you will find there are more camels there in the wild than anywhere else in the world during the 19th century, as pastoral properties in particular pushed further and further outback, they needed to develop a significant transport network. And bullock wagons uh, didn't work as well out in central Australia, and so they, re they resorted to the camel. They imported large numbers of camels and their Afghan drivers. And so there's quite a remarkable population of people who have descended from these Afghans who still live in parts of Australia such as Maree. 
So, Max, what generation Afghan are you? Third generation. Third generation yep. Australian, yeah. Whereabouts did they actually come from, do you know, in, in Afghanistan? Oh, I think Baluchistan, I think they came from. Oh, yeah. They come over because they knew how to work with the camels. How are they used, mate? They were used for carting supplies everywhere, from Mari to wherever, mainly up the Birdsville track they went. Max, when I was a kid, we had chooks running around the yard. You had camels. We had camels in the backyard, yeah. There was heaps of camels everyone had in their backyard. Marie, there's a painting of an Afghan on the wall in the pub here. What do you know about him? The painting is of B.J. Dervish, and he's my grandfather. Oh, OK. And uh, he's actually quite a famed camelier. He went on the Calvert Expedition, oh, right. which went right through the deserts into Western Australia and somebody was lost and he went back and looked for those. He was very adamant that he was going to find them, which he did, mm. and he was presented with the actual compass and okay. the actual diary from the Calvert Expedition at Parliament House. They brought the Camellias out here to open up the country virtually, mm. to do the um, telegraph line and the east-west railway. Do you wish the Camel days were still here? No. Now, why is that? Too hard work. <laughs> you think so? Yep. Yeah. Well, your dad, how did you know that? Your dad was worn out? Yeah. Would he be away for days or? Well, they took three weeks to go for me to Birdsville to put a load on. Uh huh. So, so probably it's... about a month they would have been away. So tell me about the big camel trains. How many camels in, a, in, in one mob? They used to have about 30 in a, a string, and Dad had 120. Camels. Wow. And did they ride any of them or they walk beside them? Um, walk beside them most of the time. Yeah. They took the um, commodities up to the Streslecki track, up to the stations up there and brought the wool down and take three, four, couple of months, whatever. The first truckies in Australia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in 1929, the railway line was extended from Maree to Alice. That meant less work for the camels and the cameliers. But it did bring other employment as the railway changed gauges in Mari, so goods needed to be loaded between railway trucks. If you were travelling from Adelaide to, to Alice Springs, so you jumped on a train in Adelaide and you came to Port Pirie, you got off the broad gauge and from Pirie to Mari you'd come on the standard gauge and when you got to Mari you would jump off the standard gauge onto a narrow gauge. Within 800 kilometres they had three different gauges. In Maori at that particular time, there were three lots of people. The white Australian people lived on this side of the railway line. The Afghans lived on the other side of the railway line. And if you're Aboriginal, you lived down further towards the Birdsville track. Okay. But in my school days, we're all friends. Mm -hmm. And to this day, whether you're black, brown or white, we're all friends. Yeah, we're all from Maori. In 1980, a new railway line was laid from Adelaide to Alice Springs. The new line bypassed Mari. Mari died overnight. They took 30 houses out of there within three months and it left it sort of a little lonely town. I actually have bought Mum and Dad's old house, mm -hmm. which is down the other side of the town. So I come back quite frequently. I love Mari. Uh, a song that I've only just written, so I, I'll have to read it. Because I've broken my glasses, I'll have to borrow a meg. It's one of those messy sort of days for me, Andrew. What is it about Mari that makes a girl go back? Remembering the camel is out on the Birdsville track. Surely not the publican with his lousy hotel room. Surely not the cold wind through a chandelier of spoons Surely not the bush fly in the corner of her eye No, there's got to be a reason why Cause there has been a drought out there for seven years too long The coolabars are dying out on the billabong Stations all around are looking worse for wear I'm searching for a reason why she feels at home out there What is it about my 
tree that makes a girl hang round Is there something deeper in her heart that she has found It seems to be unspoken, the thing I cannot see I wonder if she'd pass it on to me Cause there has been a drought out there, it breaks my heart to see A town hanging on to its life so desperately But they're singing around the fire like they don't have a care So I'm looking for a reason why she feels at home out there Where well, there has been a drought out there for seven years too long Bars are dying out on the billabong Stations all around are looking worse for wear So I'm searching for a reason why she feels at home out there Yes, I'm looking for a reason why she feels at home out there In my song, A Thousand Feet, I used uh, the soft and gentle sand, but there was a lot more behind the words than that. Here's a song I wrote west of Hermansburg. Uh, I was a guest of the Aaron and Mob out there, and I uh, camped on a sand dune with uh, Mount Sonder in the background, the sleeping luber, and I was wandering around the bush thinking I might be the only bloke that's been here, and then I thought, how stupid is that thought, you know? With 40,000 years or so, the people have been there, so I ended up writing this one, it's called A Thousand Feet. It's not a hard place It's a soft and gentle land Gonna lay my bed On the soft and gentle sand Hear old man time Whisper in my ear A thousand feet I've been through here Hear the desert wind Play a lonely tune Through the desert oak on a rusty dune Stay a while And it's all so clear A thousand feet Have been through here Inca, Inca Pichicala The Dreamtime stories sound like wonderful fairy tales but they do often show how much the Aborigines understood their landscape. My grandfather's land and um, that over there is Nurula, um, Goss Bluff. And um, the story for us, long time ago in the dreaming, there's this big dance up in the sky, they were dancing crobbery. And um, there was this coolerman, a uh, wooden dish, or a cradle with a baby in it. Someone was holding it, and it accidentally fell. It fell there, all the way from up there. So. Every morning and every night time you see the two bright stars. That's the mother and father coming looking for their baby. So the baby's still here. It's amazing really that the local mob weren't far off it because Goss's bluff was indeed made by a large object falling from the sky. It wasn't actually a wooden cradle, but a giant meteorite. I think I prefer the old story. Hear old man time Whisper in my ear A thousand feet Have been through here Take it slow Take a look around All the signs Are on the ground Bird and snake and lizard and Kangaroo An ancient man Aboriginal stories could be told through song, dance and pictures in the sand. The girls tell the best stories. There'd be a fire, then there'd be, say, people's, there'd be a, say, mum sitting down there, you know, little one, come a little one, you know, dad would be sitting here, big windbreak. Paintings like these led to the highly coloured dot paintings that most people associate with Aboriginal art. 
yeah, little dogs over here. So the dogs would be done by dog tracks, isn't it? Like that. And going this way is a couple of tracks, like a person's track. The Aborigines developed a remarkable understanding of the nature of the land they inhabited and their mythologies, as we would tend to call them, their, their stories, their dreamtime stories show they can see that a river, for example, is meanders in the way that a, a snake may have passed through it. They can understand uh, saucer shapes, such as you get a Wilpina Pound. The dreaming story behind the saucer-shaped Wilpina Pound is another remarkable example of Aboriginal insight. My old mate Arthur Coulthard is from the Andamutna mob. Stay a while. And it's all so clear A thousand feet have been through here Arthur, um, your mob is called Anya Matna. Yeah, that's right. Um, and this is the Anya Matna area, the Wilpina Pan. What, what does it mean to your mob? Um, Anya Matna comes, comes from the word uh, rock group of the Flinders Ranges. Wilpina in the Anya Matna people, it comes from the word Ikara. Ikara means meeting site or a gathering place. In the dream time, mm -hmm. um, there was a ceremony taking place down here and um, two large serpents that slid its way down from the northern Flinders Ranges. Snakes. Because they knew that there was a lot of people here for the corroboree, uh, the snakes came in, ate up all the people. Oh, wow. Two people got away. Uh, the fully initiated people. Okay. But uh, all and the, your descendants all, from them. I'm I'm descendants from those the fully initiated. Yeah, wow. that's right. The most famous view of Wilpina Pan, of course, is from an aeroplane. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be these two ridges shaped like that. In the dreaming, when the serpents came all the way down, forming what we know now as the Heisen Range, um, and forming around. Um, to make the walls of Wilpina. So the two snakes are actually laying cupped together. Okay. It's quite mystical how the Aboriginal people got their Dreamtime stories and you wonder how they could have created these stories without actually being above it. Because even if you're on top of the highest hill you can't still see the formations that they could see in their stories. I take a breath and call out loud This is all out my weathered skin but I hold like a river gum and fight on till it rains again bounding like a kangaroo just as far as I can reach across the world like a boomerang landing home on the beach this ancient land itself means a lot to the Adnumatna people. Aboriginal people are really, really connected to their land through um, songs, um, just the dreaming stories, and um, just the day-to-day -day relationship with the land. We don't own the country. The country owns us. This is our, you know, we're part of it. And um, if you respect the country, the country will respect you back. This ancient land is a 
It's such an old landscape and so right here where the ranges are um, we've got granites which underlie everything which are about 1200 million years old and then sitting right on top of that are sandstones which go back to about 800 million years old and then after they were laid down there was an enormous buckling of the landscape which lifted up this very large range called the McDonnell Ranges and that's then gone on weathering through long periods of aridity and moisture and so that even though the ranges are so old when you look at the rivers that flow through it the passage that they follow is a meander which doesn't match the shape of the landscape at all it's reflecting an even older landscape shape. When original man came to Australia exactly as now water was the key to survival here but conditions were different then. Well, when the Aborigines arrived, which is these days thought to be about 50 to 60,000 years ago, Central Australia in fact was rather wetter than it is now and they were able to move down through Central Australia and they inhabited areas which were at times quite lush. But because of a, a mixture of factors, partly it is uh, changes in the climate, there was a very dry glacial period uh, going back about uh, 30 to 15,000 years ago and that dried out much of uh, central Australia and brought it more into the condition we know it now. And on top of that the Aborigines themselves influenced the, the environment, they shaped the environment at least partly through their fires, uh, their frequent burning of the land for a number of reasons to so that they could stimulate fresh green growth, uh, so that they could better hunt uh, to create pathways for themselves through, through the environment. They also contributed to the change. Young grass is coming up, then people just go out there for hunting because they know all the animals are going to go over there with a burn place with. So they keep doing that. They let the other, other part grow. Um, when, when all the grass has been eaten there, they burn, burn this side. And it's just all management like keeping the animals without um, putting in a paddock. So you just burn the grass and they'll all go where the new shoots green grass are. When Europeans arrived, they didn't find a pristine landscape as people have often spoken about. In fact, what they found was a landscape which was already much influenced by and managed by human beings, by the Aborigines. Um, for those people who don't know, I. Uh I'm called the Mallee Boy, but I was actually brought up in Northern Victoria, which is called the Mallee District, in fact, um, where uh, very good wheat country where we are, Kwambatuk. And this, in fact, is uh, probably the first time I wrote a song that actually says I'm not only proud to be a, a bushman, I'm very proud to be a Mallee Boy. Well, I've ripped and dug out burrows on a sandy bullock hill. Eradicating rabbits doesn't take a lot of skill But a boy born in the Mallee doesn't find them hard to kill No self-respecting farmer lets a rodent eat his weed He'll shoot them and he'll skin them, dress them up to eat But since the spread of Mixo, he's almost got them be. And I don't mind at all if you call me a Mallee boy well, little town dogs howl at the morning train Where a cocky makes a living on 12 inches of rain Where his woman provides and is rare to complain And I still love the smell of that sandy soil Some say it's dusty, some say it's gold Cause it grows the sweetest fat lambs the market's ever sold I don't mind at all if you call me a Mallee boy. My dad and granddad were farmers, and as a young bloke I was too. So I know it's always been difficult out here. No, I don't mind at all if you call me a Mallee boy. It must have been harder still for the first European settlers who had no idea how different the climate the soil and conditions were. The European farmers or grazier that came out had never experienced 
the cycles we have in this country, we sort of have a boom bust where we'll get a success in two or three wet years, very, very good years back to back, and then we may get three or four very dry ones. And of course, these blokes had come out here not, not experiencing anything like drought. Whereas in the early pre-European, of course, the Aboriginal people knew how to manage this country. So they didn't have a lot of, well, they didn't have any domestic livestock. The climate certainly is very different to what people expected when they first came here. And there were some remarkable examples of uh, people interpreting the Spinifex grasslands as waving wheat fields that could carry 80 beasts to the square mile. That just must have been a time when it had been wet and the Spinifex were seeding prolifically. But uh, mostly the country is dry. And uh, you, when you look at the long-term rainfall record, uh, the majority of rainfalls uh, our small rainfalls are well below average and then the average is actually built up by this long tail of very, very high rainfalls like in 1974 is about um, 900 millimetres and the average here is about 285. I'm often asked what's uh, my favourite song that I have written and that's not easy to work out when I've written 350 or something. Like that. I guess it's this one because it does take me back to uh, to uh, when I was on the land myself. Galleries of pink of Crystal nights with diamond stars Apricots preserved in jars and That's my home Land of oceans in the sun Purple hazes, river gum Breaks your heart when rain won't come It breaks your heart Takes a harsh and cruel drought To sort the weaker saplings out It makes room for stronger trees Maybe that's what life's about Wilpena Pound was the scene of two good examples of optimistic settlers overreaching themselves. Keith Rashid has run Wilpena Pound for most of his life. Henry Price um, recognised Wilpena as, as a very fertile area because of the mountain range around us and the, because of that we get a lot more rain just in here, in the rainfall area. So he recognised the potential of this country as a grazing property. So Wilpena Station, when, when Price came along, um, he had an area of about 400 square miles um, and he ran a couple of hundred thousand sheep and perhaps two or three thousand head of cattle. And of course everything was done with horses in those days, so he would have had three or four hundred head of horses as well. In most decades in the 19th century had some very severe droughts, which impacted very severely upon the expansion of European settlement. Uh, the, one of the major ones in the 1860s, for example, led to a re-evaluation of the land to some extent. Through ignorance, I guess, over a period of 20 or 30 years, because of the stocking numbers, they overgrazed this country. Well, government land distribution policy in many ways encouraged overstocking and overexploitation of the land. In the pastoral industry, it was necessary to put as many animals on the land as it could possibly stand, simply to be able to keep up with the government rentals. And, and that often meant that when drought set in, there were simply too many animals there and they were very vulnerable and would potentially die in their hundreds of thousands. And then we had a succession of droughts and then poor old Henry Price who'd made a real go of and established Wilpena Station as one of the icons in, in Australia, um, fell by the wayside through ignorance. And, and droughts, successions of droughts of course in this country, it's a pretty fragile land and uh, they didn't know how to quite manage it. 
in the mid-1860s, George Goiter, who was the Surveyor General of South Australia, was sent out to try to work out those areas which were most affected by drought. And he drew a line on the map where he perceived that the drought had had its most major effect. Goiter based his line not on the rainfall he found, but what natural flora he observed. These plants were able to survive the long-term climate. Within that line where there was a higher rainfall, agriculture could expand outside that line. Only the pastoral industry could survive under better conditions. So Goiter's line was established as a, a, a limitation upon agriculture. But then there were a series of good years in the 1870s and rainfall meant that the, the countryside was looking really good and showed great potential for agriculture. So pressure mounted on the South Australian government and it eventually gave way and opened up land which had previously been described as being outside the, what was going to be viable. And so you find quite a remarkable expansion of agricultural settlements. But it's Australia. Drought came back. It was simply uh, too intense a drought for most of those farms to survive. And as you drive through that countryside these days, you will find the remnants of those farms scattering the countryside. Winters come, the hills are brown. Shops are closed, the blinds are down. Everybody's leaving town. They can't go on. It really was the bravest, most foolish expansion of agriculture in Australia. They didn't understand the land well enough to know that there were these cycles. Drought would eventually come back and agriculture would not be viable in those regions. The south wind through veranda goes, winds and bangs the homestead doors. A mother curses dusty floors and feels alone. Trucks and bulk bins filled with rust Boy leaves home to make a crust A father's dreams reduced to dust But he must go on Tortured red gums on a shame Sunburned country wisely named Chisel plowed and wire claim, but never, never, never tame. There was a real irony to the next act in the Wilpena Pound story. The Hill family were farmers from near our nearest local town, Hawker, and um, they were struggling to grow wheat down there because. Rainfall's a bit lighter than in the pound, and Wilpena Pound has a lot heavier rainfall than the surrounding areas, so in the fertility of the land, they recognised that, so they came into Wilpena Pound and grew wheat. Before they grew the wheat, they had to clear all the timber, so they cleared pine trees with axes, they rolled them with a big old ship's boiler to roll it flat so they could plough the land, and they grew wheat very successfully. And interestingly enough, whilst drought beat the, the graziers in this country. It was flood that beat the, the hills, the family that were growing wheat in the pound, because the only way in and out of Wilpena Pound is through Wilpena Creek. And of course, at 22 inches of rain a year, considerable floods can come down this creek. So, and they'd build a road in there by hand to get their supplies in and get their wheat out with bullock droves. And after a succession of about three floods washing their road away, they thought, well, this is a bit too hard. So. They persevered for about 25 years, very successfully, and finally flood beat them. Yeah, you wait two years for decent rain To save a thirsty crop And now it's going yellow Cos the bloody rain won't stop But that's the way it is Where inland rivers flow An irony that real bush people know Not surprisingly, the early settlers did make some other mistakes. Before white men, the Aboriginal lived here, and they, they had the land to themselves, and they had the food. Because anything grew out of the ground, the Aboriginal had. And when, the, when the, brought the cattle here, well, they had the same thing. 
Well, there you are, and it's gone, see? You know, that's, you know, that's fair dinkum. The cattle and sheep initially had a, a very big impact on the landscape because previously um, hard-hooved animals had never been there and uh, they cut up the soil resulting in soil erosion and uh, gully erosion for instance but they also targeted particular kinds of species things like um, salt bushes that were quite succulent and tasty were decreased and then other species that had tougher leaves that were largely unpatable or poisonous or spiny um, and just simply weren't available for browsing were often encouraged. We've got to look after our country up here otherwise it won't look after us. So Exactly. Um, so you you know, this is this environment. We've got to look after our old country, but you still need the stock, but to a certain extent. You you can't flog it, but mm. like you get hard clay pans and that the stock break the the hard clay pan breaks that top crust off and that lets the seed in, lets the sand in. Holds the water a bit. Holds the water and then the germination long as you don't too many stock and, and flog it. it, you know, but in moderation it's good, but it's just about management, I think. An old forester once said that it's important to leave parts of Australia in its pristine state for our children's children. And why not for the bush itself, not just for the people? And that's why I became an ambassador of Bush Heritage Australia. This group acquires areas of this wonderful land to conserve and restore. Bush Heritage is aiming to achieve both a uh, reconstruction or a recovery of damaged areas, but also protection of those that are still considered to be intact. Craven's Peak and Ethelbooker are on the edge of Western Queensland and they're quite remote places. Um, and even though they have a history of pastoralism, the systems are still pretty much intact. In other words, there hasn't been a lot of modification because of cattle grazing. A lot of the plants that originally were there are still there. Um, there's not a lot of soil erosion and soil loss. Um, a lot of the, the flora and fauna that was originally present is still present. One of the reasons why Ethel Booker and Craven's Peak were purchased was because we do know a lot about the fauna that are in the dune systems there. And the reason for that is because of the work of Chris Dickman from the University of Sydney and his team. We've just pulled this panther skink out and what we'll do now is take it back to, um, to the car. We'll, uh, we'll measure it to see how long it is, we'll weigh it, we'll try to see what sex it is, if it's cooperative, and uh, we'll also mark it so that we can recognise if we catch it again, and then we can get information on survival, we can get information on, on movements, um, the habitats they use, reproduction and so on. They've been going out to that area for 20 years or more, studying the, um, the natural ecology of the fauna, the reptiles and the mammals. This is a sandy inland mouse. This one's a little male. He's not showing any signs of reproductive condition at this stage, and that's probably reflective of the dry conditions that prevail here at the moment. Not much seed, not many invertebrates, not much green plant material to eat, so he'll postpone breeding until the good times come. The mammals in particular are able to move huge distances. If they, if they run short of food, they don't really think anything of moving three kilometres in a night. We've recorded the smallest of the, of the native rodents and the marsupials moving 14 kilometres over just a few days. And if you can imagine yourself jogging from Sydney to Melbourne and back over a long weekend, that's what these guys are doing. It's an incredible feat of endurance and it's, as far as we can tell, unique to the Australian desert situation. Mammals in other parts of the world don't do this. Well, another day, how many k's? 1100 odd. We're smack bang in the middle of the famous River Todd. And racing up the riverbed, it struck me very odd. Boats with hairy legs, it's true, so help me God. Then I met the local poet, he said his name was Ted. He didn't know how to play guitar, so he played a box instead. It's also very simple, just drink two dozen cans, squeeze it like a bagpipe and belt it with your hands. Ain't the mate as we're on the road is what we want to do Heading for the 
ballast with a dink and show and crew. With a raggedish rig that we can find, a rattle trap will do. Just learning how to live the life of the land of the kangaroo. Thanks, Ted. Very good, John. Well done. <laughs> Happy memories. Great memories. That was back in the early 80s. Uh, not far from here is where the great uh, Australian watercolourist Albert Namajira was born and I've tried to pick up on the story of his life. His great nephew had told me he was once just a camel boy. And I mentioned the sleeping luber in this song. That's what uh, the Aranda mob called Mount Sonda, a big lady lying on her back out there in the range, the western boundary of the western Aranda country. I'm at Hermansburg, meeting up with my old musical mate Warren H. Williams. Warren is Albert Namajira's great nephew, and Hermansburg, well, it's the mission where Namajira was brought up. He was from here. We grew up, born out west, and um, came into Hermansburg. And a lot of the kids from around here went to the church, went to the school. They got jobs here, like working for the cattle station, because it was one of the biggest cattle stations in Central Australia. A lot of the Aboriginal people worked as um, stockmen. He was just a normal person up until Rex Batterby came to the picture. Melbourne artist Rex Batterby visited here in 1936 to paint local landscapes. Rex wanted a camel boy or person to carry all his stuff, food and painting equipment. Albert Namajiris became Rex's camel boy. In that time, Albert showed some interest in Painting. They called him Camel Boy, but he was a man. He walked behind us with a billy. He tended the campfire and he made the tea. Drowned in the colours we didn't see. And the ghost gum stand, gleaming white, showed him a paintbrush. He showed us the light. Drowned in the colours we didn't see What a man was he, Albert the Cowboy Encouraged by Batterby, Albert Namajira started to paint and his painting showed the outback as it had never been seen before. In fact, he opened our eyes to the unique colours of the centre. The colours that he used, even today, people still don't. When they see Albert Namajira painting, they go, ah, that's not the colours. Places don't look like that, but they actually do. When you come out here to the centre, the colours are actually like that. The blue, the red, the green, it's just the colour of Central Australia, and he painted what he saw. It's Namajira, he became the one We remember all alone Under a huge sky with a gentle hand Painted the pictures of an ancient land. This painting gave him success like he paid a lot of money. He had enough money to buy himself a house. But in those days, Aboriginal people were citizens, so they could not do anything with his money, you know, because he was in a citizen. He couldn't build a house in Alice Springs. The success brought him, I reckon, this much happiness and a whole lot of sadness. But eventually, Albert Namajira did become the first Aborigine to be given Australian citizenship. He was the first citizen ever made in his own... <laughs> citizen made in his own country. So um, the Queen actually, she made him... You know, that's the highest thing you can get, to be made a citizen. What fools we were, what did we mean? Dressed in white meet the queen, take down her picture, hang up a ghost gum, put up a landscape by the camel boy. Cause her majesty was in his eye, the sleeping lubra, the yarn of the sky. I apologize for the condescension Paid no attention to the pain of the camel boy. 
So when he became a citizen, he was allowed to do anything like any other Australian citizen could do, like buy things that Aboriginal people couldn't buy, like grog. In the Aboriginal way, if you're buying something, you share with all your family. Um, there's your uncles, your aunties, your cousins, you know, then there's your father's brother, who's your other br father, and so on and so forth. So people still do that, and Albert, with his success, because he, he had a lot to share, so he shared it with everybody, all his family. And that was one of the things that sort of got him into trouble, I suppose, for caring for your family. He thought he did the right thing, but did the wrong thing. He ended up in jail for um, supplying um, grog to non-citizen people. A proud man being chucked in jail is, you know, yeah, falling from grace, really. Namajira's paintings were hugely popular and the first Aboriginal art to become widely known outside the Indigenous community. And the ghost gum stand, gleaming white, showed him a paintbrush, he showed us the light, drowned in the colours we didn't see. What a man was he, Albert the Camel Boy. The European settlers never understood the amazing culture and knowledge held by the indigenous Aussies. Around the campfire, we're yarning about the explorers and wondering why they didn't seek help from these wonderful Aboriginal people. It took the people in Sydney, it uh, took them from 1788 to 1813 to cross the Village Mountains. Mm -hmm. If they'd asked a couple of local blackfellas, they'd probably say, well, just go past that tree and <laughs> through that gap and you're there. You know, but uh, <laughs> they just bl blundered on. and. And so many of the explorers blundered on because they were so tough. I suppose it says a great deal about early Australians that they, uh, the, the explorers who did trek into the outback uh, all too often didn't pay as much attention to the local knowledge of the Aborigines. The Europeans really believed that they were a superior people. They dismissed the Aborigines as not really effectively occupying the land because they didn't build fences and build houses and have properties and do all these things which the Europeans saw as representing civilization. They tended to dismiss the Aborigines and, and their ideas and their knowledge. They didn't see how the Aborigines could possibly inform superior British scientific expeditions about such mundane issues as where to find food. You can imagine though the uh the, the, the pull of the, the what was over the next hill, it must, must have been so exciting for them. Eh? Yeah, but it was pretty featureless around here though, and, and again, that uh, they weren't used to such tough country. Mm. And uh, tough and merciless, because uh, it's never going to just rain for you overnight. No. And the temperatures, you know, they were, he was saying it was 110 overnight in the... He said, why did we bring blankets? He said, we should have brought mosquito nets because they got eaten alive by mosquitoes. Giles was as good as any of them in terms of results because he did a good job and he uh, didn't have too much bad luck. A few days later, I've come to part of the country explorer Ernest Giles travelled. Here, he attempted the first European east-west crossing of Australia in 1873. Low sandstone hills broken and split into most extraordinary shapes that once no doubt had been some of the cavernous depths of the ocean were to be seen in every direction. Little runnels with a few gum trees upon them constituted the creeks. I had climbed high hills, traversed untold miles of scrub and gone in all directions to try and pick up the channel of a wretched dry creek, when all of a sudden I stumbled upon a perfect little paradise. Usually the better the explorer, the better writer they were, and some of their works are worth reading for just the literary content alone. Giles writes very graphically about how tough it was and you sort of admire them for their tenacity and their perseverance and their courage, but you're constantly wondering why in the hell they did things so stupidly sometimes. And, and when Giles uh, discovered, in white man's terms, what we now call King's Canyon, uh, they went out in October. Now, it's pretty hot in, in Central Australia in October, and you'd reckon you'd go out in May or something like that. Looking out from King's Canyon today, I can see across the desert plain Giles was struggling to cross. On ascending a high sand hill, 
I found we had upon our right hand and stretching away to the west an enormous salt expanse. It appeared, however, to be bounded by sand hills a little more to the left, eastwards. So we went in that direction. But at each succeeding mile, we saw more and more of this objectionable feature. We walked a distance on its surface, and to our weight it seemed firm enough. But the instant we tried our horses, brine spurted out with every step they took. We dug a well under a sand hill, but only obtained brine. But the big problem was always, where are we going to get the next water? So Giles was out there and he, he wanted to cross, the, it was Lake Amadeus, wasn't it? The big salt lake that he hadn't been able to get across and he wanted to get across it and along the way they couldn't find enough water. 50 miles over such disheartening country today has been almost too much for the poor animals. In the tank there was only sufficient water for one horse. The others had to be tied up and wait their turns to drink and the water percolated so slowly through the sand it was nearly midnight before they were all satisfied and begun to feed. And little soakages, you might take a day to give a horse enough water out of a soakage and he writes up these very graphic details in his diary and they were, they were all wonderful bushmen and navigators by the stars and things like that. We could see the lake stretching away east or east-southeast as far as the glasses could carry the vision. Here we made another attempt to cross, but the horses were all floundering about in the bottomless bed of this infernal lake before we could look round. All I could do was to crack my whip to prevent the horses from ceasing to exert themselves. They staggered at last out of the quagmire, heads, backs and saddles, everything covered with blue mud. Their mouths were filled with salt mud also, and they were completely exhausted when they reached firm ground. Eventually they came to this wonderful lush place that we now call King's Canyon, and they swam in the lovely cool water and the, uh, everything was right for them. A small pass ushered us into a new valley in which were several peculiar conical hills. We came to a flat, open valley running all the way to the foot of the new range with a creek channel between. The range appeared very red and rocky, being composed of enormous masses of red sandstone. The upper portion of it was bare, with the exception of a few cypress pines moored in the rifle rock, and I suppose proof to the tempest shock. fine-looking creek lined with gum trees issued from a gorge. We followed up the channel and Mr Carmichael found a fine little sheet of water in a stony hole about 400 yards long and 40 yards wide. This had about four feet of water in it. The grass was green and all around the foot of the range the country was open, beautifully grassed and delightful to look at. Having found so eligible a spot, we encamped. The creek passed through a kind of low gorge about three miles away. I called this King's Creek. It was by far the most agreeable and pleasant country we'd met. A year earlier, Giles had discovered a lost world. Soon after leaving the natives, we had the gratification of discovering a magnificent specimen of the fan palm, a species of Livestona, growing in the channel of the watercourse with flood drifts against its stem. Its dark-hued, dome-shaped frondage contrasted strangely with the paler green foliage of the eucalyptus trees that surrounded it. The outback is special because it has a unique assemblage of flora and fauna, plants and animals, um, and ecosystems that you'll find nowhere else on the globe. There are particular places like Palm Valley where you have endemic species that are found nowhere else. The Palm Valley palm, which is a Livestonia species, is one that's definitely novel. It was a perfectly new botanical feature to me, nor did I expect to meet it in this latitude. This fine tree was 60 feet high in the barrel. These species are what we call relic species. They're remnants of a system that's long since died out over the vast area of the landscape, um, dating back often over a million years in when, when the area was predominantly rainforest or forested. And the reason why it's been able to persist, and that's quite really the key to this, the secret to the significance of the place is because of the nature of the rocks that surround the valley. They're very porous and they're also structured in a way that when, when it does rain, 
the water gets directed straight to the valleys and to the root zone for these species. So the palms and a lot of other plants that require really quite moist conditions in a very arid landscape can persist. Well, I suppose one can see that there are parallels between Palm Valley as a small isolated area in Central Australia and, and Australia's isolation from much of the rest of the world. And in many ways, much the same sort of things happen, though obviously in a, in a vastly different scale. The Palm Valley is a unique remnant of uh, very much more tropical time. Arid Australia seems to have a few of these things because uh, there are other trees called waddy woods which occur out on the edge of the Simpson Desert and there's one population on this side of the Simpson Desert. The outback is impossible forever and it's free No way can I find an end to what it means to me The outback I'll sing you the minor Steel and coal, opals and diamonds, silver and gold, emeralds and sapphires. I wish for you holes in the outback. Lakes and there's rivers, caves to be found. And there's another landscape underground. On 120 kilometres east of Alice Springs at Altunga, where the discovery of nuggets in a dry creek bed in 1887 triggered a gold rush. The people who went to remote areas like Altunga to mine obviously were extraordinarily tough. Most people had to walk there, they had to carry everything that they needed in terms of their tools and their food and their accommodation. They pushed wheelbarrows over these extraordinary distances, over extraordinarily harsh countryside to get there. And once they were there, of course, it was very hard work and it was largely human labour in these very harsh conditions. Wandering through these buildings, it's hard to imagine there was a thriving community here. People went out there and despite the isolation, despite the shortage of water, despite the adversity of the very harsh climate, they established a town which I think at its most reached about 3,000 people. And now all that's left is a handful of houses and mining equipment. The seeds of the long-term failure of Altunga were sown in that isolation. There were limited deposits of gold uh, and over time the absence of water, the harshness of the environment meant that the town died away and gold mining essentially disappeared over time. And while a few people lived on there for many years, it became a ghost town and these days of course that's what it is. I actually wrote this song back in the early 80s when I first came through uh, this area and it was all gravel road then. But uh, it's quite an easy chorus. After more than 20 years, I've come back to the apple mining town, Cooba Pedy. I'll have a go now. In a dusty lean to town, with a dusty digger's face, where you can buy an opal if you can stand. we're looking for when we're tunnelling through the ground is to find some trace. Um, it can be potch which is coloured as opal and uh, what we have here is, is a seam of potch but we'll follow that and that, that can develop into a nice pocket of material. Um, that, that's running up to it's about three eighths of an inch thick there. Generally it pinches out but when you uh, find a good pocket it will go thicker up to up to an inch, sometimes bigger, but when you find a good level, it can travel for quite a distance over a claim, claim and a half in distance, and that's when you start to make quite large volumes of money. 
I've never been on the moon, Merv, but it must be very similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called the lunar landscape around here. Oh, okay. So how did it all start? Well, it was in 1914 when a 15-year-old kid named William Hutchison came up here with his father and a few of his father's mates from Adelaide looking for gold. Okay. They didn't find any gold, but young William had been scratching around and he found a few what we call opal floaters, which is opal that gets washed out after the rain. and Sitting on the top. Yeah. As soon as his father saw the opal, he went straight back down to Adelaide, registered a claim, and that's how it all started. Had to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, I think they must have tried to for a while, but it didn't end up being that. And you've got to watch where you walk around here now. These holes, how deep do they go? They're 25 metres deep, and there's one and a half million of them around here. Wow. And uh, that's what the guys use for getting down into the mines. They drill these shafts, and they go down on a, an electric winch or a set of ladders, and then they go out sideways. You want to hear how deep it is? Yeah. Oh. I think you just hit a Chinese fellow on the head. <laughs> you can hear the abuse of me. How come you started living under the ground here? Oh, that's well, because when they first did it, it was 1914, 1915, they started living here. And, and after the First World War, a lot of guys came back from Europe and they were living in trenches in France and that. Oh, okay. You know, and they know built that. little places, yeah. they lived in the slit trenches. And that was the and, reason? Yeah, and they started using the same method for oh. building homes here because there's no building materials here. So they just, instead of adding stuff, they just took away stuff and just moved in. Wow. And that's why the Aborigines yeah. called it Cooper Pity, which means white man's burrow, because they saw these white guys living in holes in the ground. They thought we were living in burrows like rabbits. Well, the bloke at the local garage knew the town he now despised. He said it really had character. Now it's all commercialised Well I'm blowed if I could see it It had a hell of a way to go But his petrol was dear as poison So I guess he ought to know yeah. In a dust I started in the industry a bit over 40 years ago. Early days was it was very hard, extremely hard. There wasn't any water. Uh, we used to collect our water off the side of the road and store it in 44 gallon drums. A drum of water would last us uh, four weeks. We used to carry about six drums of water. When we all started years ago, we didn't have much equipment at all. Uh, it was basically pick and shovel to start with, that's many years ago. Then compressors came in, uh, tunnelling machines, bulldozers, drills. It's, it's all come in over the last 30, 40 years, which has made it a lot easier. Well, this is my home, John. As you can see, it's a dugout. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice garden. A lot of work in that garden. Succulents obviously work well in this oh, climate. It's about the only thing that works in this climate. That, yeah. <laughs> I'll open the door for you. Oh, thank you. Fantastic, look at this. Oh, this is beautiful, man. It's pretty good. This is a kitchen <laughs> in here. But uh, go straight through the kitchen, and that brings us into the lounge room here. Oh, look at that. It doesn't look like there's been any machinery cutting this out. No, all this was done by hand. It's oh, really? 60 years old. You can still see the original uh, jackhammer and pick marks that miners made. Yeah, you see them on the wall there? Oh, yeah. But they got down here 
through this hole here originally. I dug their way down here by hand. Right, so it's almost like a mine, isn't it? But it's not really. It's yeah. It was dug out for a house. And can you can you go downstairs as well? Well, it's funny you should mention that because yes, you can, and we've oh, done well, that right that. here. So <laughs> Fantastic. Come, come and check this out down here. Can you keep going down? Well, until you strike water, I guess. Oh yeah. Aha! Uh -huh, look at this. Yeah. It's even downstairs. even nice and cooler here. Oh, look at that. Now this has been dug by machine, hasn't it? it has indeed. From the side of the hill, huh? Yep. Uh -huh. You notice the difference straight away, can't yeah. you? Yeah, and that's the, the pattern of the gouger. What do they call those machines? Tunneling machine. Tunneling machine. <laughs> Same thing Fair you right. use out of the mines. Okay. Yeah, but you see the natural colour of the ground here? Yes, yeah. yeah, the rust and the cream and all those beautiful outback colours. What, what are the advantages, uh, did you see? That? Oh, constant temperature all year round, uh -huh. um, no air conditioning needed, yeah, um, no complaints from the neighbours, make as much noise as you like. All those things. things. All those good things, you know. They could have a recording studio out here too. Probably absorbs the sound pretty well. Well, the blacks call them white fella burrows, looking like ant hills everywhere. And blowers pop through those sandstone dumps, looking like hammerheads in the air. In the middle of nothing but salt bush. It's alien and it's rare No piece of cake on a gravel road To write you that I care In a dusty lane to town With a dusty digger's face Where you can find an opal Many of the miners in Cooper Pedy seem to have ended up there after escaping upheaval and oppression in Europe. So where were you born, Joe? In Czechoslovakia. Uh-huh. So why did you come out here? Come to Australia. Mm. No, because, you see, that's, uh, we got a problem in Czechoslovakia in 1968. The right. Russians come in, sort yeah. of occupy the Czechs yeah. and this and that. I just want a freedom, sort of, you know what I mean? And I just come to Australia. I think me about, say about what? About three, four months, come to Kupapiti. So, how does anyone start over mining? You get a, what they call a PSPP, which is a precious stone prospecting permit. That entitles you to peg a claim. You have to put in a plan to the mines department and register it. I've been in lots of opal mining towns and they're always fantastic to find songs because you get such wonderful characters from all walks of life and from all over the world. When you see that, that opal in the world, just your heart stop. Oh, I bet. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, when you see that top stuff, your heart stop and just you look at it. Forget about the diamond. My no. diamond, that's piece of glass. Yeah, like this. White. White. Right? White. Exactly. That's like Nothing. a bit of grappa. I just look at it. I look at it and put it down. Have a smoke. I just <laughs> think. Flashes of dancing colour, green and gold and red. Mixes with black and you're on your back. Digging until you're dead. Well, it's not about a fancy car. It's not about the cash. They passed the hat for a swimming pool. And they built it in a flash. No, it's all about the opal. You get it in your eye. You see a glimpse of heaven with angels in the sky. And you're a dreamer, you're a drinker, a bull ant in a hole. You're a schemer, you're a thinker. You're a lonely soul. You're gouging for the opal like a wombat or a mole way out there at lightning. When you see the opal, it's 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 not the money. It's when you see this opal and then you 
you cut it or somebody cuts it for you, then it gets set and it goes to somebody purchase it and you see it anywhere in the world. You look at it and you think, there's only a handful of people that actually still do it and it's, 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 it's like a drug. You do it for the love of it. When you see this stone, you just think, nature can, can actually use it. Now, when you find the opal, that's your business, your family business. Yeah. You know, or partners, you know what I mean. So you got one partner, two partners, like myself, I'm working with my son, mm. right? If you find something, that's it. Nobody know. Of course. Right? How much, so much, is nobody know. Don't ask any questions. Don't snoop around his claim. He'll be out with a dog and a shotgun. Who knows why he's hiding or why he makes his stand? Men like him are buried alive with opals in their hands. No, I'm not from the rich person. I never hit, I never strike a big uh, opals. But I find small amounts, but uh, I try to have many skills for myself uh, to cut opal, to jewelry. That's why I have a little shop here. Also, I do mining. I never stop from mining. Uh, I like that. It's my, in my blood, I think. Uh, my missus complained, but I don't want to stop. <laughs> right, have you ever had the, the mine come down on you or collapse on you? Or? A few times, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's scary. Oh, oh, it's very scary, man. Oh. Very scary. You shit yourself. Mm. I'm sorry about it, but <laughs> you shit yourself, man. <laughs> I can imagine. When oh. you start, yeah, you know, that's actually happened to me twice. Once in the sorry, from here today, you know, I'm just stuck in it. and fall down, and now you try just go out. Crawl after when you're coming out, so you forget about it. Mm. Fuck it. Um, sorry about it. Forget about it, Oprah. <laughs> but you have say, to go back. You must go back. Okay. Yeah. You must go back uh. because something that you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Something bad happened to you. That must something just hiding there. It's like a drug, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is where we've extended the motel. Um, we had originally 10 rooms, and that was so successful, they decided to build on rooms. And the one thing about building on rooms in Cooper Piggy is that you can no longer mine in the town. Oh, okay. But while you're building and extending, if you find any opal, you get to keep it. And, and what happened here? Just up here. We actually see the opals that we found in situ. Um, we got about 141 opal seashells out Amazing. of the Amazing, what, by accident? By accident. The, the guy that was cutting the room actually yeah. went on a little bit off the square angle. So by the time he got to the eight metres deep, he had to square the room off by going another half a metre deeper. And that's when we found the first shell, Queenie, and behind her we found the 141 shells. Oh, yeah. now explain the shell. The seashell is a fossil, but the okay. shell itself actually disintegrates and leaves a hole or a mould in the ground. Oh, okay. That fills with the water and silica and eventually becomes opal. Are you allowed to tell me how much they're worth, what you found in that little spot? Well, we've got a box in, the, with the opals in there. That box yeah. is worth about $300,000 worth. Oh, um, holy we've mackerel. we've sold a few bits and pieces. The cities, they're all the same. It's a different life out in the bush, I think. And especially Kuripedi, it's that mix all the different nationalities and the different life and the opal as well. Kuripedi, that's the best place in the world, man. That's the best. Why? Why? Because we are safe and we are sort of, we got a freedom. On the edge of Cooper Pedy, I've come across a strange but very typical Opal Town artwork. I'm always inspired by these kind of artistic pursuits because everything here that you see is from this immediate area. Like he uses the local stone and in an Opal mining district you've got a lot of wrought iron and lots of old lamps, you know. Chairs cost you nothing for the dinner setting. <laughs> He's got a pizza oven in the middle of his backyard made out of adobe kind of stuff. It's just wonderful.
If you had a bit of junk in the backyard in suburbia, it wouldn't look right. But when you have so much of it, it all makes sense. You find artists like this in every mining town. Cooper Petty to me is typical of the freedom of spirit that's present in the outback. It's where fresh ideas are born. There's a nice kind of anarchy, the kind we saw in the movie Priscilla Queen of the Desert. And we have unlikely heroes like Ned Kelly and the Jolly Swagman. Once a jolly swagman camped by a billabong Under the shade of the coolabar tree And he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boiled You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me Down came a jumbuck to drink at the billabong Up got the swaggy and grabbed him with glee and he sang as he stowed that yumbuck in his tucker bag. You'll come out waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. And he sang. Waltzing as Matilda, he I think, in many ways captures the Australian national psyche or many of our cultural come values. It's about a sheep thief who commits suicide trying to escape the police and therefore it encapsulates the significant elements of our history. It has a jaunty tune, but I think it's more than that. I think it's the fact that it, it has always resonated with Australians as representing something which is part of our history, which is unique. Down came the squatter, mounted on his thoroughbred. Up came the troopers, one, two, three. Who's a jolly jumbuck? you got in your tongue You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Sing it out. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Who's that jolly jumbuck you got in your tongue bag? You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Up got the swaggy, jumped into the billabong. You'll never catch me, alive, said he, and his ghost may be heard as you pass by that billabong. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Come on here. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me, and his ghost may be heard as you pass by that billabong. The outback is a unique and beautiful landscape. But what I really love about it is the people, their toughness, their resilience, and above all, their optimism. You gotta be optimist to live on the land, you know? Um, there's a, probably a few times in the past few years during this drought that, you know, you think, oh, why do you bother? But, you know, someone's gotta live out here, might as well be me. Where ancient mountains are whittled down Millions of years to a little mound Where giant feet are fossil found I see Spinifex surfing on a dune The rock is redder in the afternoon Tourists clicking madly soon Where spring will come with any rain A chance to flower and seed again Forever garden rise and plain The dangers of the wild remain Where the awe-inspiring power of time Leaves some fearful some sublime white man finds his progress 